This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari here from the western fringes of the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park. My name is James Hendry and I've got a spanky new hat on today. I hope you like it. BK is on camera. That is his thumb. Please talk to us for the first 45 minutes using the email address kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. We have got giraffe to begin with today. A lovely set of giraffe, a journey of giraffe, four giraffes here. Now it's a, been a fairly blustery, coolish kind of a day here. I'm going to guess that it's about 23 or 24 degrees Celsius, which is around 73 degrees Fahrenheit, which for us feels quite cool in these parts. Always nice to see some giraffes. Sometimes they're here and sometimes they ain't. And what's interesting here is that I think we've got four lady giraffes and there's actually one big bull giraffe off to the left. I'm not going to ask BJ, BK to go to him now because he's behind a tree, but as soon as he moves out from behind the tree, we'll go to him and you'll see that he's much bigger than these guys. And they are eating and enjoying the coolth, I think, of autumn. Hello, Murray and Ross. I don't know how many spots a giraffe has. I couldn't begin to tell you. I suppose we could count them, but that would take us all afternoon, and frankly, who has the time these days, you know? I suppose in lockdown we all have the time, but in honesty, Murray and Ross, I'm just not that interested in how many spots it has. Let's have a guess. I'm going to say that that giraffe has got roughly mm, 324 different spots. There you go. All giraffes will be different, of course. I don't think they'll all have the same number of spots. And as you can see, they've all got very different patterns. Although superficially they look the same. So once, what constitutes a spot? At what stage does a spot become a patch? What stage does a patch become a stripe? All right, let's try and see if we can see the bull. BK, mainly because he's doing such an amazingly good job of hiding behind that tree. Can you see him? He's actually behind that tree. Full-size bull giraffe hiding behind a scraggly bush. Let me sneak a little bit forward. I think it'll be quite nice to see him. There he is. Now he's, I'd say, a good 15% bigger than the cows on our right-hand side. And he's eyeing them out. He's definitely got his eye on one of all of them. And this is a classic arrangement of giraffes. Four ladies in a loose social structure one bull following at a distance, checking them out. Well, 
apparently we're going to go up now to and beyond Angola, where Rowan has got a great menagerie of wildlife to show you. Very good afternoon, everyone, especially to all the kids and families joining us today. So, uh, Marcel and I decided to, because it's warmed up quite nicely, is to come to the watering hole, uh, Clara Dam, to be exact, to start off with. And it's actually quite nice. We thought that, you know, maybe in this heat there'd be a couple of elephants or something coming down to drink. And lo and behold, on the other end, there is a very large elephant bull, beautiful tusks on him, um, with the hippos in the foreground. And then just a little bit to the left, there's also a buffalo bull just lounging in the water, you know, just having a very relaxing time. I think as we've been watching this elephant, what he's been doing is throwing mud on himself every now and then just to cool down. It seems that he's already come for a drink, which are quite, it's a very good start for us. Beautiful afternoon. I've uh, got a few cumulus clouds coming in. I think should make for a spectacular sunset a little bit later. And we have got an right. incredible drive planned um, for today. Of course, it's the day before Mother's Day, so we need to make things happen. Here are all the hippos. Quite nice, it echoes into this direction. I often wondered if, because especially on this watering hole, we used to get a lot of animals coming in from the east, huge herds of buffalo coming in and then drinking a lot of water. And I also often wondered how the hippos feel about it. Pranan, age seven, has asked what type of binoculars you need for safari. Pranan, if you come to safari um, with us at Anbion Ngala, what we'll actually do for you is we'll give you a set of binoculars, a set of nice Swarovskis, which you can share with whoever you come with. Um, so don't even worry about bringing binoculars with you. And these are the ones we use on Safari as well. So just come to Safari with me and then we'll give you binoculars. No problem there. It's actually quite nice. When I was a kid, I used to always take photos through by my binoculars as well um, and especially today with iPhones and everything it's actually quite easy to put the camera lens on the side of the binoculars and you can use it as a zoom what a good way especially if the animals are this far you know in the distance it gives you a spectacular zoom and with any cell phone technology these days they pick up rather well that elephant is starting to drink now Maybe just having a bit of a rest. But spectacular bull. Very, really, very nice tusks. And it's nice to have him and the hippos in the same frame. Christoph, who's only eight years old, and from here as well, from South Africa, is asking if a hippo could attack an elephant at a watering hole. Christoph, um... At maybe a younger elephant uh, if maybe the elephant threatened the hippo's baby it would but otherwise elephants are technically the real king of the jungle around here um, we've had elephants attacking hippos rather than the other way around so I think maybe circumstantial oh you can see the hippos yawning in the foreground not a very large yawn but see the mouth open up so Christoph unlikely to happen but I think maybe if the hippo feels under threat of course it's going to try to defend itself um, so this is quite the nice thing in summertime when it's when it's very very hot you'll find elephants walk right into the water here and they actually go swimming and that's fun to watch I think you might have seen it at Juma right so we're gonna still spend a little bit of time here um, see if this elephant maybe comes closer or what else comes down to drink. But for now, we're going to send you to Trishala, who also just wants to say good afternoon to everyone.
everyone and good afternoon to you all. I have found us uh, some tracks. I'm just trying to figure out where they are again. There they are. Also, yes, it is me. It's Trishala with Davi on camera this afternoon. Yeah, we have a really nice track. It kind of looks a little too big for a male leopard. It almost is the right size for a lion. But we've got to also look for the fact that the sand here is quite soft. So even my footprint looks a little bigger than it actually is. Let's take this out the way. So we can see there's three lobes. That's the palm. That's this part of the hand. And you can see one, two, three, and four toes. One, two, three, four. And it's walking in an easterly direction this way. So why don't we take a short walk down here and see if we can get any more tracks. I see another one here. And these tracks are large. So the tracks of leopards and lions look very similar in shape. There's just a difference in size. So we're going to have a look down here if I see any more tracks because the animal was moving, remember, in this direction. But I don't see any could possibly be slightly old but I'd say that those tracks look pretty good hmm I think it might just be a large leopard track because there's another one because if it were a lion we'd expect that a lion would be with its pride right especially if it's a female but if it was a male it would be a much, much bigger track. So I think we just have a really big leopard track in some soft sand. So that could be Tingana, our dominant leopard in the area. But we'll just have to follow up and see, right? I think that Sorry guys, my mic sounds a little bit funny. I hope that's better. I think we should go down Rebecca's road. Hi Alice, you'd like to know why do leopards have spots? Leopards have rosettes. I know what you mean though, but they're called rosettes. And they have them so that they can kind of camouflage in the bush so when they're still when they're not moving because they have spots all over the place your eyes can't make out a distinct shape so when they're lying flat in the grass waiting for their prey to come along their prey will have a, a tough time seeing them even though to us it thinks oh but they have spots all over it's so, so easy to see one, but it's only when it's on a white piece of paper and you're coloring it in in your book or something like that, that it's easy. Sorry, Nats, I'm going to get that from you one more time. I know I have to send you somewhere. Perfect. All right, James has uh, some antelope for you, and I'm going to keep on following up on these tracks. So let's send you over. We've got a great, vast abundance of antelopes here. Well, we have about 12 kudu, which is unusual, I'd say. Big group of 12 kudu, and then we've got some nyalas. And these two nyalas were doing their dance for each other until very recently. In fact, they are doing their dance. Watch them carefully. Classic. Now, for those of you who've never seen this before, 
This is how Nyala bulls display to each other. Rather than engaging in combat that could cause injury, get out of the way, Kudu. That's called trying to steal the limelight, that is. Thank you. They do this dance, and then if the dance doesn't quite settle things, if this Tai Chi demonstration doesn't settle things, they will set to each other in a ferocious battle of the horns. And that really is impressive to watch. I don't know if the one on the right is about to relieve himself or what the story is there. I mean, that really is quite impressive. Tai Chi dressage. <laughs> the Kudu are desperate. Desperately trying to take the limelight. Natalie thinks the back one looks like Pepe Le Pew with his tail up. <laughs> Pepe Le Pew. Haven't thought about him for a long time. What's up with these kudu? Now oh, imagine the patience it must take to engage in a Tai Chi dressage event like this. Kudu females think that they're being absolute idiots. Us, we think Kuru have stripes to try and break up the outline of their bodies in thick bush, which might make it more difficult for predators to hunt them in. So that's our best guess. It's got something to do with probably trying to make them slightly more difficult for predators to find. I mean, this is the most astounding thing to witness. Look how slowly he's trying to move. I don't know how many of you have done Tai Chi before. I did it very briefly. But the very, very slow movement Extremely reminiscent of Tai Chi. The other one's given up, bored. Look, I, I know it's not exactly like watching two heavyweight boxers going at each other. Adam, we do not see Okapi on this drive because we're in the wrong part of the world. We need to be in Central Africa, in the Congo, in the rainforests of Central Africa in order to see the Okapi. They do not occur in the semi-arid woodlands of north northeastern South Africa. They don't occur in Bushveld. So you won't find them anywhere other than in rainforests. I see now Pepe Le Pew's got his tail back up. Good. Well, I mean, this is pretty entertaining, but it's sophisticated, uh, sort of uh, deep appreciation entertainment. Much more entertaining on a visual level is elephants.
nothing as boring as watching a sophisticated fight, hey, Marcel? Right, so then the back now, we've got a different uh, elephant bull. It's, it looks a slight bit younger. And you can see his tusks are a bit smaller than the other one. But it was interesting, he was here earlier. He was actually standing with the buffalo, then he moved off. And then he waited for the larger one to move off before going there. I think he's now scratching his leg against the other leg. And it's like he's just sniffing around uh, where, the other, where the other bull was. Try to determine. I haven't seen him drink just yet. Just see the trunk moving up and down, up and down, just trying to take in all the scent. So the hippo is coming out a little bit as well. I hope he poos. I actually really hope the hippo poos. It is the funniest thing to watch when they poo in the water and they use their tail as a rudder and it just scatters everywhere. I think now you can also see on the water that it's moving from the right to the left so there's quite a nice breeze coming from the eastern side. Sarah from Singapore who's only seven years old wants to know how old elephants are before they start growing tusks. So Sarah in my experience I think you start seeing the tusks popping out just over two years old but this is also very genetic um, because sometimes you'll find elephants here, large cows or even bulls that never grow tusks throughout their lifetime and it's all to do with their genes and then of course some tusks are larger than others but usually just over two to two and a half years of age you'll start seeing elephants growing tusks. I had this sensation now when I was sitting here watching the elephants with the water moving past us from the right to the left that I actually thought my vehicle was moving forward. It was quite a weird sensation. thought I'd just share that with all of you. So that elephant, him walking now, that's in a northerly direction away, is following where the other elephant bull went. You often find bulls together, younger ones with older ones or very big ones all together. Of course, they are quite social animals, them coming out of herds. And the males would usually get kicked out at the age of about 14, well, 12 to 14 years. The mom or the matriarch will push them out of the herd and then they have to go off by themselves. So often they find companionship with other bulls. We'll just watch them go. The buffalo has just lifted its head as well, looking in the direction of the elephant. So saying farewell. Quite a nice spot for the buffalo to lie down. He can see everything around him. You know, not too much danger here either. And nice and cool. Abigail, Abigail from Florida wants to know how many babies can a hippo have? Uh, Abigail, one at a time. And I think throughout its lifetime. Ooh, how long does a hippo live? About 40 years. So one every two, two and a half years. Let's work that out. First, first baby would probably be around mm, six. So I think throughout its lifetime, maybe five or six babies. I'll have to check that for you, Abigail. But I know they only give birth to one at a time. And they usually give birth in the water. I've yet to see a hippo birth. Would be absolutely phenomenal. Would right, so yeah, their lifespan is 35 to 40 years. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Eight months gestation. I think they could have quite a few throughout their lifetime. Okay, so we're going to leave this washing hole now that the elephants left and then continue further east. But for now, I'll send you to Trish, who found a lizard. We have found a little lizard. I think this little guy is a common flat lizard, but we get lots of variants in different races or different variants of this lizard. And you can see it's kind of got a bit of a blue tail. Look at that eye. And what beautiful spots. Now generally, when lizards are youngsters, they have very vivid coloring. That just means that they have brighter spots or brighter colors on their heads or their tails. Hey, 
can be a reptile. They, of course, like to sunbathe, and that this little guy is in a patch of sun at the moment. Hi, Hoppy. You are in the UK. You'd like to go to animals get sunburnt. Animals that have their skin exposed can definitely get sunburned, but you'll find that generally animals that hang out in the sun are mammals, and mammals have a lot of hair covering them. I know we get sunburned quite a bit, and that's because our hair is definitely not as thick as, say, an impala's hair. So we suffer from sunburn while impalas don't really. In fact, they don't at all because they have fur all over. Now, animals like this, they have scales or scaly skin, or sometimes they're smooth, but they don't have the same type or the skin of that the skin that they have is not working the same way ours is. Usually there's little ridges and things like that. But scales are pretty much skin that has folded over and gotten hard and then becomes armor and protects an animal. Now that type of skin is generally not not too susceptible to sunburn because it's made so that these animals can stay in the sun because they're reptiles as well. So they need to absorb as much as they can. Oh, he's going to enjoy this. A lot of sun, so we're going to let him enjoy it and warm up and we'll send you back over to Rowan at Anne Beyond Zingala with his beautiful elephants. Right, so just as we were supposed to leave, this whole herd of elephants just came bumbling down. And I say bumbling because every single time they come close to water, it's usually the youngsters, they kind of increase their pace. And you could see there's a very small one just to the right of that whole herd. I'm hoping it comes into the water and just plays around. They it's literally it's phenomenal to see them coming because the, you can just feel their happiness as they approach water it's turned out quite well so i think it's something they can fit about seven liters of water into that trunk and then feed it into their mouth to drink we'll see what that baby is up to it's like it's not really in the mood to drink Teresa from Brazil is only six wants to know if elephants ever become aggressive. Teresa, they do, um, <laughs> but usually it's our fault. Um, I would be completely honest. You know, if, a, if any animal archer becomes aggressive towards us, I don't know, Teresa, if you're asking whether they become aggressive towards us or other animals, but if they become aggressive towards us, you'll have to ask yourself, you know, should I be here? I mean, is this really a human's place um, in a big land river? And so it's usually our fault, but they do get aggressive. I think the most, well, I, I got charged by an elephant cow one day and I had to reverse back and I had six guests behind me on the vehicle. And they were loving it. And so I had to almost put my left knee up on my seat and I was trying to look over all the guests as I was reversing and everyone was standing up trying to get photos. So yeah, they do get aggressive. For now, we're going to send you to James. He's got little bee eaters. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful little birds, these. They are certainly some of my favorite, and they're quite fun to take pictures of because when they take off, they come back to the same spot. And so you can often get quite nice pictures of them. Oh, there are three of them now. Three little bee eaters. Very special. One of them just yawned.
now we want them to fly away and bring back an insect. Let's see if the third one returns. I think it's a little one that's left there. It's making a sort of begging sound. And back again. Just amazing how they do that. And now we need the sun to come out for us. Come on, sun. Make them look pretty. What I really like about them is the very slight hint of blue that they have on the tail. It's very slight. Much less than their similarly coloured bee-eater cousins, the swallow-tailed bee-eater, but it is there if you look for it. Cool. Well, that was nice, wasn't it? I don't think they'll be back. Doesn't look like they're coming back. They look to be gone. I'm still wearing my lovely little Johnny Appleseed hat. I think this will be the last segment with my Johnny Appleseed hat. We're now going towards the hyena den, and we'll see if the bebes are out. We won't spend too long there if they're not. Hello, Timo and Isaiah in Russia. Nice to hear from you. Uh, the difference between a game reserve and a national park is not enormous. A national park is owned by the state, but a game reserve is not necessarily owned by the state. So this particular piece of land we're on is a private game reserve, so it's privately owned by individuals, and a national park belongs to the country, belongs to the state. But essentially they're the same kind of thing. They're both spaces where wild animals are allowed to live hopefully free of human harassment. Well, that's not always possible, of course, because humans are very good at harassing nature. There comes the sun. Where was the sun when we had our beautiful bee-eaters? All right, let's go back to Rowan. He's still got his elephants. He's still at the waterhole. Let's go find out what they're doing. Well, that is the end of it. Ah, oh, there's another elephant actually making its way down now. I think if you sit here long enough, you might just see elephants and elephants and elephants and elephants coming. So those two younger ones are younger bulls trying to keep up with the herd. So I think they're going through that process where the matriarch's actually kicking them out. The third one that just joined from the right, he's not come down to drink. I'm wondering if he wants to take a sip before he goes. But then they'll, yeah, there we go. There's some water. And they'll end up trying to follow the herd at a distance. They've also now moved off to the north. It seems all the elephants are coming and then all of them go north. It's quite nice. It's a big, beautiful game path there. Um, possibly even made by elephants. Oh, it's lovely with the sun coming out on them, isn't it? Um, beautiful game path there that they often follow. So, again, path of least resistance. So it makes sense they all walk on the same paths. It's nice with the sun just breaking through on them. There we go. Finished drinking.
Palaksha, what signs do elephants use to communicate with each other? So, any any elephant that seems unrelaxed, actually majority of animals, the first thing that gives it away is the tail. It curls up, or in the case of an elephant, it actually goes upright. Um, it will, oh, there's the rest of the herd at the northern end, northern side of the dam, just walking past. It seems they're going west instead of north, far in the distance. Um, they'll splay out their ears to make them look bigger. But of course, elephants communicating with each other, they do it. Um, it's a stomach rumble that they can pick up through the pads in their feet. Actually, so we can hear uh, the stomach rumble as a human being, but they pick up on different frequencies than we can. And I think that rumble can travel up to 50 kilometers for elephants. It seems that the big bull is also not coming back. Actually, no, that's the smaller bull coming back from just to the left of the herd. Oh, there's more elephants coming. We actually heard the different herd, uh, the other herd, a little bit earlier while we were sitting here. And I think it's just more and more and more elephants coming for an afternoon drink. Isn't that lovely? Ah, the trumpet. It's a very small baby. So See what I meant with the bumbling down to the water? I get so happy and they go straight in. It's an amazing shot. A sit here all day. <laughs> okay, so while we wait for more elephants to come out, we're going to send you back over to Juma, back over to James, who's with Ribbon and the cubs. Well, there was certainly one view of a cub, but I don't know where... I can hear them squealing down below there. But as yet, the little ones have yet to come out again. But she's feeding them, which means that I think that this is a, a good time. We will give it some time because I think they'll come out and play after they've fed. No, hyenas, well, I mean, they are related to dog, but they're not very closely related to dogs. They are more closely related to cats and more closely related still to things like mongoose. Which are other kinds of little carnivores. They all belong to what we call the same order. So cats, dogs, mongoose, badgers, weasels, uh, what else? Otters. No, otters? I think, mm, I don't know about otters. I've forgotten. They all belong, yeah, in fact, otters belong to the same order, which means that they are relatively closely related to each other. They're sort of, I mean, I guess you could say they're as closely related to each other as cows are to deer. There you go. But they are not as closely related to dogs as you might think just because they look superficially like dogs. All right, the elephants are still out and about where Rowan is, so let's go back to him while we wait for the cubs to come out and play. So we reckon there's probably about 50 to 60 elephants here already. Definitely three different breeding herds as they've managed to come down. And an enormous bull, you can see him towering over the rest. 
um, as he's now going down to drink. It's spectacular. It's honestly, it's absolutely amazing having this many elephants coming to drink. And it's not like today is the hottest day on and beyond in Ghana, but yet here we are and you just see elephants everywhere. So this is a time where I should feel sorry for hippos because there's a lot of water leaving this watering hole right now as all the elephants come down to drink. But isn't that just a magnificent shot? Wow. See, summer has just gone on or gone in a lot further than the rest to try to get to water. So of course also cooling them down on the legs. Oh, one's breaking a tree. Yeah, they're cracking. Even Natalia, who's in final control, talking to me in my ear, is saying this is one of her favorite moments. I agree with you, Natalie. It's spectacular. And you could honestly watch elephants all day. That bull that I was describing, that's towering over the rest, who's also now drinking, he's missing his left tusk. Might have broken off in a fight, or broken off while he was trying to strip bark from a tree. A small baby just underneath his trunk, also trying to drink. It's often funny to see, especially the very young ones, they don't really know how to use their trunk just yet, and so they'll just dip their entire head in the water and drink like that. But that one seems pretty able. Good stance. Baby elephants are the cutest things. On baby the elephants are the cutest things on the planet. I agree with you, Marcel. We had this entire plan for the afternoon safari saying, okay, are we just quickly going to check Clara Dam and then go further east, see what's there and then come back. But I mean, you don't leave something like this. Phoebe in the UK wants to know why do elephants have such big ears? Uh, Phoebe, I think their ears are actually proportionate to their bodies, but with these elephants, they have a massive network of veins running behind the ears and it's actually another method for them to keep cool so Phoebe if you keep watching you'll see every now and then all the elephants will flap their ears and of course this cools down the blood behind their ears it pumps around 12 liters of blood through the veins um, per minute so that cool blood then enters their body and cools their entire body down so I think having a bigger ear more veins and oh, just cools them down some more. Isn't that just spectacular? Also, such a peaceful sound to listen to. So, elephants tend to be quite fussy about the water they drink, but these aren't too much. They usually walk into the river and dig, dig holes. It seems the water here is perfect. Even Natalie saying this is such, she just said, wow, such a cool moment. It is, and having all these elephants on the same side drinking, it is really truly spectacular. Actually, the water here is a bit clearer than the water in the middle, not as rippy, more like a mirror. James from Johannesburg he wants to know how deep the elephants will go into water. James, they'll fully submerge themselves, and I've seen it here as well, and it's quite, it always reminds me of the Loch Ness Monster, kind of, that I used to watch when I was a little kid. Um, that they'll completely go underwater. And every now and then you'll just see a trunk come up and they'll breathe some air and swim around. They love the water. So they'll completely submerge themselves if they can. Actually, maybe today, because it's not that hot, they don't really need to do it. But it's really fun to watch because they've become so playful in water. Okay, it seems ribbon cubbies are out, so we're going to send you back to James on Juba. Yeah, 
they're back out and they are having a little play and it's just too unspeakably cute. Hmm. One of them's taking a leaf out of her mother's book and having a snooze. Now, you had a good look at them yesterday and reckoned that one was male and one was female, correct? And that's quite interesting. It's always nice to watch two different genders raised in the same family in the wild. It's, or I always find it fascinating to see the little different personalities developing. All right, kids, you can carry on watching. Those of you who are adults who wish to ask questions can now do so using the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter, twit. or you can use the YouTube chat stream or the Twitch stream, which is getting used more and more, interestingly. By those of you who are gamers, don't fall, little one. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Too wonderful. Now oh, they are properly cute. And yeah, I don't know. I think Ribbon probably sleeps for around about sixteen hours a day. Most of the daylight hours, she's asleep, or certainly dozing, maybe not fast asleep. And then, you know, come just after sundown, just as it gets dark, she'll go foraging quite often, and won't often won't come back until the morning. So if, I'm going to say 14 to 16 hours, sometimes more if she's had a really big meal. Someone is going to fall off that termite mound, surely. And you'll see that every single day they just start doing a little bit more. Ireland, they definitely share a common ancestor, mongoose and hyena. But I mean, <laughs> if you go far enough back, we all share a common ancestor. But they will share a common ancestor more recently with mongoose, unless I'm much mistaken, more recently than they will with dogs or with cats. And then more recently with cats than with dogs. And more recently with all other carnivores than with us, say, or with primates. It's a nice question, that. I think I've got my phylogenetic tree correct, but I might be slightly off. Now we will bite Mum's ear, because that is a good toy. <laughs> you missed that, sorry BK. He fell over to the left there. He fell over totally onto his back. Or well, she fell over onto her back. Marion Ross, the gestation of a hyena is around about 110 days, unless I'm much mistaken. So, almost four months.
so much to explore and so much to investigate. Imagine our own kids just required a couple of sticks to play with, as opposed to the endless, seemingly endless supply of different kinds of toys. We could easily have another plummet into the hole now. Imagine all you needed to do with your baby was go into the garden, break off a stick, put it in the crib, and then when it was old enough to play it would just go into the garden and find something, sticks to play with on its own. Be a lot more simple, wouldn't it? Shannon, there's not a great deal of disciplining that goes on. If they step out of line, I suppose, if they start irritating Mum, she just hits them. There's nothing um, subtle about it. There's no gentle cajoling or uh, modern parenting techniques where they sit down and have a discussion about the rights and wrongs of what they did and whether they'd like to consider doing a different thing next time round and uh, how they think that their actions have affected the feelings of another hyena. They just get slapped about the head, bitten, and, uh, well, then they learn that way. I'm not for one moment suggesting that's how human children should be treated, but that is how hyena babies and lion babies and all other babies out here are treated. And that's how their hierarchy is maintained, purely with violence. So it is a pretty violent society, that of hyenas. Not always. I mean, you can see a lot of affection going on here. You can just hear in the background the chin spot batters. sex them at this stage because they haven't stuck out the bits that are important. But I think we said male and female yesterday. Serona's, I think you'll find that these cubs will be substantially stronger than any domestic dog of the same age and size. These are powerful, powerful animals. <laughs> that uh, climbing expedition is quite impressive. They might not look like it, but you'll find that dogs the same size wouldn't have anything like the same jaw power, I don't think. They wouldn't have as well-developed teeth. So I think that they would uh, literally eat a domestic dog of the same age for breakfast. A big hyena weigh in the region of 70 kilograms. There are not a lot of dogs that weigh that much. I mean, I don't know what, a, what does an Irish wolfhound weigh? Someone can tell me what an Irish wolfhound weighs or what a boer bull weighs, very popular in this country. Burble. But I would imagine that a fully grown hyena weighs, I, mean, I think a big burble probably weighs about 70 kilos. No. Oh. So Lou says the Irish wolfhound weighs in the region of 120 pounds. That's about 55 kilos. So a big hyena would is is heavier, certainly. It doesn't look as big as a wolfhound, but if you saw them next to each other, you'd see how much more muscly and how 
much more substantial they are. And I think that if you were to pit one against the other, really the hyena lives a life of violence. It understands violence. It's like a prize fighter versus a, a, a big gym bunny, if you know what I mean. Somebody who understands how to handle themselves in a violent situation is always going to be more effective in a fight than somebody who's spent a lot of time building his muscles in the gym. And that's what the difference between a domestic... <laughs> between a domestic dog and a hyena is, pretty much. All right, so now apparently an English Mastiff weighs about 150 kilograms. That's the heaviest recorded dog, I think. And, well, I guess that would probably be able to... That'd probably give a, a run for its money. Or give a hyena a run for its money. Again, though, the hyena understands violence. And so if the dog grew up fighting, I suppose, then might, mm -hmm. it might well be able to take on a hyena. another car arriving so the cubs might go inside. So the average weight of a massive is 73 to 100 kilos. All right, Trishala has now had some success. Let's pop over to her and find out how it's going that end. We've managed to find some elephants here on our western boundary. I had seen quite a lot of, a lot of um, leopard tracks. So we were just checking the boundaries. It's always a good, good thing to do. Establish something's entered or exit, and we did see tracks entering at Zoe's, which is probably Hukumuri um, from last night. That's generally when he moves around, that's generally the entrance he uses. Yes, hello, my girl. Scratch that, yeah. Anyway, we were searching around there, and then we came across these beauties. Calming elephant sighting. I'm just going to grab that thing from you again, Annette. Hi, Vedant. You're from Singapore. You'd like to know why do elephants have tusks? Tusks are very, very useful. Hopefully they'll demonstrate to us when they're feeding how easy it is to break branches and the angles they can use to break branches and get to all the good stuff that they like to. Sometimes in the middle, sometimes in outer bits and mostly the orange, bright orange inner bark of a tree which is called the tree cambium and they can use the tusks to peel the bark off trees. They can use it to dig. They can use it to fight each other, especially with the males. But it is not so essential that it would be terrible for their survival if they didn't have it. That's why tuskless females and males as well do all right. I mean, tuskless males probably find it a little bit more difficult because they, they, um, let's just get onto the ledge here. 
because they do need to fight. It can be hard for them sometimes. If they have no tusks, as you would imagine. But most of the time, <laughs> it was very sweet. Um, most of the time, tuskless individuals still fare all right. In fact, even animals that have their trunks um, chopped off, sometimes that happens, or lions hung onto them, and they have a very short trunk. Not just short as in a little bit cropped, but maybe only half a trunk left. Those individuals are also still okay. Animals adapt very, very easily. Sometimes things can be dire, of course, but I've always found that animals are excellent adapters. This little one is adorable. I would say that ribbons, too, are even more adorable, too, so let's go and see. exhausted by parenting. You can see she's thrown her head back in exhaustion. She's so lucky to see this stuff. Now we've got some stick play on the other side. Great deal of scratchiness as well. Listen to it whining. Question from the mayor of space, wondering if hyenas get hip dysplasia like um, like normal dogs or like dogs do. Remember, they're not dogs. The answer is probably not. That hip dysplasia is caused, I think, almost universally by overbreeding in domestic dogs. And so, you know, a hyena lineage that had hip dysplasia and it wouldn't survive, they'd die very quickly, they'd die out, they wouldn't be able to pass it on to one another because it would just simply be completely maladaptive. So I'm going to say no. Hyenas don't get hip dysplasia. Imagine if these two were born with some sort of hip displeasure, how they'd be bullied and beaten up by those that didn't have it. Because so I think it's entirely genetic, isn't it? It's a genetic defect. No, Michelle, this would have been dug by an artfark. An artfark will come and dig in lots of termite mounds around the place, trying to get the termites out. And then those burrows will be modified by warthogs, porcupines, other artfark, wild dogs and hyenas. And in actual fact, I think she does relatively little before she gives birth. She probably does a bit, opens it up a bit, and then the cubs will dig themselves into a safe cavity almost on birth, I'm led to understand. So they're born pretty precocial for predators. They're born with teeth and claws. And they're able to, I think they're able to see from straight away. Strange, cool wind blowing through the place. And I 
I'm sure that's why they're out now. I think when it gets really a little bit chilly out around five o'clock, they'll probably go back inside. Seronis, I'm sure that if hyenas wanted to lock their jaws like a pit bull's jaws, they could make their jaws lock. You know, they've got a much more powerful bite than the domestic dogs. So, yeah, I imagine they probably could. But, I, you know, I don't know anything about so-called locked jaws. You know, I, we've had staffies at home for a long time, and they get it. They're able to close their jaws and clamp them shut to the extent that they won't let go. But I'm not sure that you can... Um, I'm not sure they actually lock so much as the animal just won't let go. They can definitely do that. If you want to see some interesting hyena behavior, there's a, the latest Londolozi video. Just go into Instagram and type in Londolozi, you'll find it. It's of a hyena, a single hyena, warding off about eight wild dogs, eight or nine wild dogs who are trying to attack it. And she backs into the vehicle, the Londolozi vehicle. It's a very clever strategy of hers because they, the dogs will not go near her front end. Every time she moves away, they come in and nip her on the backside and then they run back because if they get involved with the front end of that hyena, it will not be pretty. They're immensely powerful. That's one of them. And then that very famous BBC clip of the big clan of hyenas, I think it must be 20 of them, sitting on one of the Buyashaka young male lions. I think it, they call him Red, or Red's the guy who comes in and saves him, I don't remember. But this lion gets hold of a lot of those hyenas, and they're attacking him. And he, he doesn't seem to do any damage. I mean, a male lion is a massively powerful thing, and he picks him up and he... You know, drives them down into the ground and bites them and they just get up and go. So, I mean, their strength and resilience is quite phenomenal. Oh, we have an unusual uh, <laughs> timing of this particular event today. We're having Marcel's afternoon fact of the day. Perhaps it's because it's the weekend. Yeah, it's, um, again, I deprived you guys of the mid-morning fun fact. So we thought we'd stop for a quick, well, late afternoon fun fact from Marshmallow, Marcel, Marcy, Mr. M, Marcello, whatever you want to... We've got so many nicknames for him now. Just by the way, um, apparently with the dancing, Marcel said he would rather cut out coke and potatoes, which has basically been his staple diet here at Ambion and Gala, before he dances. So I think we need a bit more extra push from you guys, because I also want to see him dance. Anyway, there we go with the fun fact. Thanks, Rowan. So, the highest temperature that's ever been created or produced by man was 5.5 trillion degrees Celsius, that's close to 9 trillion degrees Fahrenheit. And that was measured in a quark gluon plasma that was produced in the Large Hadron Collider from CERN in Geneva, or close to Geneva in Switzerland. And the uh, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is also the largest machine that's been built by man. It's got a circumference of almost 27 kilometers. So it's quite amazing. Thank you, Marcello. Okay, so we left the watering hole. Well, actually, all the elephants left the watering hole, so we also left the watering hole. But now, let's see what else we can find. The sun is going down, temperature is dropping. We have a bit of a surprise for you guys.
the breeze has stopped now it's really not too hot anymore at all okay so while we go looking for the surprise we're gonna send you back over to Trish who just also wants to give an update My update is that we've moved to where we saw the elephants moving towards and that is the clearings near Balanites. And they're all over. It's just lovely. They're spread out. Definitely not the size of the herd that Rowan had, but sizable nonetheless. There's about 20 I reckon in this herd. I love when we can put ourselves in a position like this so that they feel so comfortable to just walk around us. Hi Niha! You'd like to know how much does a baby elephant weigh? When a baby elephant is born, they're about 100 to 120 kg. That's just when they're born, Niha, so far larger than I am. I'm definitely not a newborn. So can you imagine for the occasional mother that carries twins, having an extra 200 kg sitting in your tummy? Just gorgeous. That's game drive radio going off. There were some wild dogs in the north. We are hoping they would have come down, but that was in the morning. Do you know how quick they can move? I love when they have little stuff stuck on their heads. Foreheads. They don't even realize. I really like the openness of this, of this sighting. It makes me feel like I'm part of their their environment, not like I'm just an observer, but just actually part of it. Almost like I'm part of the sighting. They're so comfortable. It's just gorgeous. No, well, elephants don't always like to, uh, the openness of this area. I do, because then we get to see the elephants better. But um, you know that often they're right in, in the bushes and the thickets and we can hardly see them. They're all over. Oh, they're nice and... Oh, just beautiful. This large one coming through here. I'm going to grab a question from you again, um, Nat. I know it's from Vedant in Singapore. I'm not sure what the question is. How do I know my way around the game reserve, Vedant asks. Hello, gorgeous. Um, I learned, Vedant, after years. Not a year, actually. It probably took a couple months to learn my way around. Um, two years soon, but there aren't actually very many, very many roads. All are pretty easy. Either they run east-west or north-south. But at first, I remember thinking, why can't they just put signs on some of these roads?
list of fish and you'd like to know if elephants are related to the woolly mammoth. They are related to the woolly mammoth and the mastodon. I don't think, don't think this little one enjoyed that, that uh, answer at all. Yes, sorry, you are not a mastodon, you are no woolly mammoth, I promise you. You are just a gorgeous, a tiny baby. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're after me again. Oh, you're after that little piece. Okay. So at the moment, the closest living relative the guy, these guys, the elephant shrew. <laughs> but yes, they did share an ancestor. And I think that's an important distinction between something being a direct descendant of. It's not like woolly mammoths turned into elephants. Um, they shared a common ancestor. I think that's an important distinction. I feel immersed into their world when they come by like that. you enjoyed this as much as I did because it's just it's amazing <laughs> anyway let me send you over to some more amazing stuff with James at the cups well it just got slightly less amazing oh no they're back out again ribbon just face planted herself she stood up to shift spaces and then slipped and banged her head on the side of a termite mound she is not vaguely affected by that, of course. She's just a little uncomfy. I can't believe how long we've had with them. This is just magical. I mean, how long have we been here? About an hour now. It's too precious. I was just thinking back to when I was at Angala, and I don't think we used to even look for termite mounds. Tips, not as far as I know, no, there are no non hyena, uh, or non, no non termite mound hyena dens. I think they're all in, you know, there's such a plentiful supply of termite mounds in this part of the world, and they have such a well established network of dens, this clan, that I don't think so, no. I mean, Ngala is so massive, there must be at least two dens. But we never, I, when I was there, we never used to look for them. And I think the guys that are there now do know of one, don't they? I'm not sure it's in a, if it's in a sig bad signal area, maybe. But it was just never a big focus, I suppose, because, you know, when guests come out and they come for two nights, what they want to see is the big five. And... Hyena dens are never a huge priority for them, which is a great pity, given how amazing hyena dens are.
perfect, perfect Saturday afternoon for the newest members of the Juma clan. up for you. I've no idea how many teeth I have in the region of 30, but I'll tell you exactly in less than, uh, well, let's, can you give me 10 seconds? Let's see if I can get it for you in 10 seconds. You can start counting. One, 34, 34 teeth. They have three sets of incisors, up and, or top and bottom. One canine, top and bottom three premolars on the top, four premolars on the bottom, and one molar on the top and bottom, giving a total of 34 teeth. The upper first molars are often absent or may occur irregularly on either side. When present, they are tiny and hardly functional. This, this is quite interesting. This helps to distinguish spotted from brown hyena skulls, for in the latter, the upper first molars are always present and are functional teeth. The lower first molar is sectorial. No idea what that means. Sectorial? Sectors? No, I don't know. Hmm. So it would seem that the molars are not in fact useful to hyenas. And so if you are, I mean, I don't know, if you've got a dog at hand or a cat that's not going to bite you if you try and do the following to it, please, disclaimer, if you get bitten by your pet, it's not my fault. Take hold of your beloved animal, lift its top teeth up or its lips up, and you'll get an idea of the carnassial teeth, which are the premolars, basically, I think. And you'll see that they are pretty sharp and they are clued down over each other so they act like a pair of scissors as opposed to a pair of grinders like ours do. Um, and then if you look way at the back of the animal's mouth you might find a slightly flatter grindy type of a tooth which will be the molar. Now in the hyena that really rear tooth, let me just check on a jackal for example which I imagine has got pretty much exactly the same dentition as your beloved Irish wolfhound chihuahua whatever it is you have at home if you do have an Irish wolfhound or a English mastiff perhaps think twice about doing what I'm suggesting you do All right. so typical cane and dental formula is 42 teeth so they've got two motors on top and three on the bottom and four premolars I'm just going to quickly read here so that you can get a decent examination of your dog. Yeah, the fourth upper premolar and the upper component of the carnassial shear is clearly adapted to slicing. The first and second upper molars are broad and well developed for crushing, so the back of your dog of your dog's teeth that will be on each side there'll be two molars and those will be flat the hyena lacks those which is interesting because it is obviously a crushing jaw but it uses its premolars for that which are much sharper and the sharp teeth that you can find on the side of your dog's mouth are the premolars now i hope none of you were bitten during that exercise your kitty will have very similar kinds of teeth But your kitty's probably more likely to bite you if you start to irritate her too much. I know my mother's would, or well, my mother's will bite you anyway. Right, Rowan is having a corking afternoon. Let's go across to him now. He's managed to find himself a lion.
And they've got a frozen picture. All right, so I've gone to the cats now, and the cat's very similar, actually, to the hyena dentition. And so if you do have a particularly, uh, shall we say, tame moggy at home, you can look at, at her teeth, and that'll be very similar to a hyena's with a very vestigial kind of a molar at the back. but take care. A cat's teeth are sharp, and I find they're not shy to use them. These creatures are just magnificent. They're endless entertainment. It's like watching baboons. background you might also just be able to hear a woodpecker pecking away. We'll go to Rowan as soon as we've got some decent signal with him. I mean I know you're not getting sick of these hyenas yet though. They're too much fun. On a gentle Saturday afternoon. plants being anal pasted again and again and again. They must absolutely stink of baby hyena by now. <laughs> Surely you're going to come sliding down, are you? We're going to try again with Rowan and his lions. If he has frozen picture, I suspect you'll be back here very soon. So what? James Link in Amoweri Link, no? Okay, well, hopefully this time it works. So here's the Birmingham Pride. Um, not really the surprise that I wanted to show you just yet, but phenomenal. Eric, Nikki, and Yapi managed to track them down at 12 o'clock um, midday today. So a very, very, very long tracking session for them. So kudos and very well done. Uh, at the moment, there are 13 lines around you. So if you do the math, it means four females, four lionesses, which are all the mothers of the eight youngsters. And then, of course, the Birmingham young male has joined up with the pride. So at this stage, he's lying down in such thick, long grass that we can't actually show you. But the good news is, is that he's joined up with the pride again. And I know a lot of you were worried about him, whether his injury is healing, this or that, so we can now confirm that he is perfectly fine and he will bounce back. It's actually quite funny, the one in the back stretching out. Some of the youngsters are starting to get restless. We had, uh, they'll roll around a little bit more. So it doesn't look like they ate last night. Um, so maybe tonight they'll end up waking up a little bit earlier than yesterday evening. I think Eric had a bit of fun with him. I'm hoping that as it cools down, all of them will start stretching and yawning and grooming each other and playing around and then try hunt again. 
Natalie just informed me that everyone's very happy about the Birmingham young male line. So are we. Although, like we said, we've we've seen him have actually worse injuries than he has had now, and he just bounces back every single time. This young male is trying very desperately to clean himself everywhere. You, Laurie, ask why don't lions have spots? You, they actually, they do. Um, faint spots. Don't know, Marcel, if you just, yeah, I'll zoom in on her tummy. You can see a bit of a spot pattern there. Obviously, not like a leopard or a cheetah, I think. It's just a different form of camouflage. So, lions blend in with the dry grass very well without the spots. So, they don't really need the spots. Oh, he's up. Go wake up the rest of the pride. So yeah, they do have faint spots, and when they are smaller, the younger they are, the more spots they have. And it's almost like they grow out of it when they wake up. Oh, that sunlight's hitting him perfectly from the other side now. Well, I'm seeing more and more yawns and cleaning each other. Okay, so we're going to send you back over to Trish, just for a quick update. My update is that I am now going to head off to Chitwa and see what luck we can have there with the nice soft light and the setting sun. Not quite setting just yet, but the light's definitely gotten a lot softer and just beautiful. So let's pop onto the dam wall there, have a sundowner together in the form of looking. Maybe a leopard, you know, just hopefully. I'm quite satisfied with the elephants for today. It's been a long time since I had a little one intimidate me, and it certainly did. Okay, southern boundary, here we go. I've been looking up in the trees a lot more um, since the, the bush has been really dense because it's so difficult to spot animals in the ground. But it's starting to thin just a little bit already. Things are getting a bit dry, um, as in the grass is getting a little bit dry. Hi James, you're 16 years old and you're from Durban, hailing from my hometown. You would like to know if I can give you advice on a good African wildlife reference book. If you're just starting out, James, I would recommend Game Ranger in your backpack. I think there's a new version out now called... I'm not sure, but it's by Megan Emmett and... Sean Patrick, ta-da, Game Ranger in your backpack. It's a really nice general book. There's something about everything that you might see out here. There's birds, reptiles, um, grasses, plants, flowers, but very generalized. It's a really nice one to start with. And once you move on from that, you have to actually start getting specific types of books. Books just on reptiles, books just on mammals. Um, books are just on trees. The Peter Apps Mammals of Southern Africa is a really good one too. Let's see which are oh if you like insects this is my favorite favorite insect reference and ID book. I remember using it at university. It was the first time I ever saw this book in the university library and I was so glad when I got my own copy. Really nice one. For, um, for insects. You can purchase most of these online um, as well as bookstores. I know exclusive books and things like that do you have them. In fact, I recently saw the Peter Apps one. 
Reader Apps also has other books um, like Wild Ways that I quite like. It's a, it's a skinnier book and it's not really a reference book, but it gives you a nice story about kind of each animal. I don't mean story as in personal story, but um, it has quite a flow. So it feels like you're reading a story about this animal, but in fact it's referenced and there's lots of information in it too. The other one is also Shaping Kruger by Mitch Reardon, also a nice one that I really like. I read it over and over because he also reference spe references specific, specific um, papers and things like that. And once you've started to read those books and get a little bit more specific, then you can start moving on to reading scientific papers. Uh, I use Google Scholar to search for papers, but at the moment, um, at least, oh, I don't know if it's still going down, but since the whole coronavirus thing has happened and lots of people have been on lockdown, many of the online publication houses, scientific publication houses, have let, let the average person be able to access them. Um, like JSTOR and even some of the houses that, could, that publish textbooks. So have a look online as well. Anyway, I'm going to make my way to Chitwa from Southern Boundary and I'll send you over James at the den in the meantime. Trishal is covering as much ground I think, as I think I covered this morning and yesterday afternoon. This is just wonderful. We're having the best afternoon here. One of them just tried to have some milk and was declined by the mother, whereupon its sibling jumped over mum onto its head, bounced off, and they ended up where they are now. The little one also seemed to try and have a bit of a sleep, but then got FOMO and woke up again. What a change this is from the hours we've spent here waiting for the ears to pop out. And now we've got them out playing in broad daylight. much you know about telepathy, aged six, but clearly something. I think there are ways that animals communicate that we don't understand. Now whether they're able to actually transfer thoughts to one another without some kind of visual or olfactory, which means smell, or audio or body language signal, I doubt it but I'm not saying it's impossible. Sometimes they seem to be able to communicate without us understanding why. And some people might say that that's telepathic, but I think others might just say, and I lean towards this, that we just don't understand how they're talking to each other. I think a really good example is the way that those great big bird murmurations or fish bait balls move almost as one organism. And if you've ever seen a video of a starling murmuration or a quelia murmuration, you will be amazed that none of those birds Sorry, I thought I heard an alarm call. No. None of those birds or fish ever crash into each other. Now, we don't understand how that's possible. You'll read articles about it. People will tell you that they think they understand how it's possible, but the speed at which the communication runs through that whole group is almost unfathomable. Are they doing it telepathically? Pfft. Maybe. It's unlikely. It's more likely that we just don't understand exactly how they're doing it. 
you watch lions on the hunt as well, you'll see that you, you won't be able to see who's saying what to whom, but they just, just seem to know where to go. Let's go back to Roan and his lions. I'm going to sit here for another 10 minutes and I think, I think we'll move on and see what else we can find. Right, so he's so busy cleaning himself. He, tend, he looks like he's the most active um, out of all the youngsters here, there's a cub that just went to the toilet that's now coming back to rejoin the pride and boom, down next to one of the big lionesses and there goes him, boom, down as well right, now he's up <laughs> and then every now and then he just gets a bite on the bum from the one behind him, you can actually see her chewing on his bum right there you know, falling asleep like that can't be very comfortable and <laughs> I should see her eyes just closing and falling asleep again so they want to play they're just a little bit tired still <laughs> maybe it's because he's her pillow and then when he moves disturbs her. Okay, now she's got the leg as well. Oh, she's biting the bum again. Right. Let go. Oh, All the side leaf. Right, there we go. Biting. Grab the tail. And she's actually just using him as a pillow, and because he moves around so much, she's getting quite irritated with him. Oh, what a disaster! I wonder where they are on that beautiful reserve that they cannot get a signal out of it. Sorry about that. Things seem to be calming down here. Light is very slowly fading. But I think it's worth sitting around for just a little bit longer to enjoy our hyenas. The hyenas we've waited so long to view for so many nights and mornings, and middays. So it might be quite nice to see if we can get that woodpecker on screen, but I think he's behind all the thick bush around here. Yes, there are many, many flies always here. I don't know what it is. Ribbon's gammy ear seems to attract flies quite phenomenally. There we go. Yeah. And then they disappear again when it's sort of just, I'd say, 10 minutes before pitch dark, the flies go to sleep. Rybone is not particularly comfortable. I mean, if I was lying there, I don't think I'd be comfortable. for a big night out, I suspect. She's not nearly as beach ball-esque as she has been. Also, there have been a lot of other hyenas around this den over the last little while. And she's the only one here at the moment, the only adult. All right, that's it. I'm done. Sometimes you just know when it's time.
George Day, Jay, what I got from this question is how are hyenas' feet considered paws? This is not a question I know how to answer because I don't understand it, I'm afraid. I suppose it's got pads and claws and therefore it's a paw? Are they considered paws as opposed to hooves? Yes, they're definitely referred to as paws. I think you'll find all members of the order Carnivora have uh, feet that are referred to as paws. I'm just trying to think. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagining they are. They certainly are in my book. I'd be interested to know, you know, what brought that question about. Are there some other paw-like animals that are not referred to as paws? That's a very good shot. Three paws there, BK. Well done. But you couldn't get all four in. Maybe you could make more of an effort. See if you can get all four in, BK. Look at that. A four-paw shot. Fantastic. A four-foot, four-paw shot. If I haven't answered your question to your satisfaction, please let me know or clarify. Now, Chishala is definitely down at Chitwana. She's got a Vasabok. Let's go across the, to that now. The spider. We are here at Chitwana, and there are a lot of antelope around on the clearings near the dam. We've got some water bath closest to us. Some impala in the distance, there's some wildebeest lying down there as well. Everyone's trying to get as much of this green, juicy grass as they still can. Oh, we've got the Egyptian geese. They have to make an appearance when we're here at Chitwa. Lovely. I also see that we have our fish eagle friend across on another usual tree. There's only the usual suspect at the moment here at Chitwa. I say only like it's a bad thing. It's wonderful to see everyone out and about. At least on this side. So maybe that means on the other side of Chitwa. There are a little spottier friends out and about. Shall we pop ourselves up into the damn wall? Let's do it. Sunny Kim, I got a bit of your question. It was which antelope has the most aggressive and I didn't get the rest of it. Oh, most aggressive fights. I think zebra have uh, pretty aggressive fights. They can have some, some really nasty fights where they can pull skin off each other and other such things. Um, and I, I kind of think hands, hands down, actually, I'm just going to pop a little bit further onto the wall because I want to be able to see it down. Some hippos in the water for us. And 
there's some people playing in the background for us, if that's what you can, if you can hear human voices. Hello, people. Very nice. Oh, we have some... <laughs> this is quite funny. They look like some Senegal lap wings. On the front there. That is staring off towards the sound of the children. <laughs> they look quite curious. What's going on there, guys? Matthew Smythe, you'd like to know if we get sable, sable antelope here. Yeah? No, we don't. Sable and rowan, I would love to be able to see. Not and beyond in Gala's rowan, but the actual, um, the actual antelope, the sable. Quiet and peaceful archer at the dam today. I think we're going to turn around and go um, around the sounds of the people on the other side, otherwise we'll have to pass them here. So let's go ahead and do that. I like to always look down on that end because um, I've seen a leopard there once and I um, had the dogs there twice actually. The other time was with you as well, Darby. And we were here. But nothing for us today. Cuties. Ooh. Ooh. We have a little crepe turtle dove having a drink. Now I know you guys don't get enough attention. Oh, doesn't it look beautiful in the light? Hmm? It's lovely. the splashing about of a, a hippo that I can't see though. Gorgeous. Where's our little three-banded plovers that I love to see around here? Oh, it's all the way. Oh, hello, tiny. Is that? No, that's a pied wagtail. Oh, so quick. It was moving so quick. Of them very cool. Don't you love the sounds? This impala chasing each other in the clearings. You can hear the Cape Turtle Dove. And you could also hear the Egyptian geese. Smells a little funky here, I must say so. There's lots of little things to appreciate going on here. I love that little family of water back in the light there, Darby. Very, very 
very pretty. Let's keep on going, see what other beautiful scenes we can find. It makes sense, but it smells here a little bit like um, when plant matter has started to rot. You know when you have a bouquet of flowers and you keep it in the water for too long? You can start to have this strong rotting smell. That's the type of smell I get there at the moment. But it makes sense because it's right at the edge. Hello guys. We've already seen you, but you're looking very pretty. Very pretty indeed. All right, let's swing around because then we'll get a little closer on that side. Maybe we'll see some action with the impalas. I'm quite entertained by them recently. Okay, I'm going to keep on going. See what we can find. I'll send you over to James for an update for now. We have got tracks of a lepardus that came down towards this waterhole, treehouse waterhole. But we've just spotted the tracks now, and I don't see them anymore. Let's just go onto the dam wall and examine the tops of all the trees and see if there isn't a lapid draped from one of the comfortable limbs around here. One would expect this to be Shidulu, the leopardess. It would be very exciting, very, very exciting. Let's just stop here and have a listen and an examine with the binoculars. fresh to me. <laughs> right, BK, well, your, your turn to answer a question. Sugar Bits, Sugar Bits? Sugar Bits would like to know what BK missed the most while he was gone. BK, over to you. Did you miss the bush most? Did you miss the cooking? Did you miss the food? The most of all, I missed tracking. Tracking? Okay, there we go. And, uh, Steve's classes. And S Steve's? Classes. Classes? Yeah, what, he, what classes uh, was he giving you? Oh. Yeah, leaves, especially leaves. Okay. I learned a lot about leaves. Well, I, I, sh I, I must apologize for not having continued Steve's classes. <laughs> I don't see any lopids currently. Okay, let's carry on. Nice little scene of the sun going down behind this water hole. I wonder if she didn't come through there. We'll just see if we pick her tracks up the other side here. Gosh, it'd be nice to see her again. Ian, it rained here about three or four weeks ago, I guess. Yeah, let's say three or four weeks. Which is totally expected at this time of the year. You wouldn't really expect much rain now. April, you'd expect there to be the last rains until you'll get a little bit of winter rain, one or two days where you'll get about five millimeters over the course of three months or so. And then you'd expect <coughs> a build up and proper rain to come around sort of November. Very exciting time that. I'm just gonna keep my eye on the ground here to see if she doesn't pop out. 
on the road. Alternatively, I'll go back to where I saw the last tracks. It's turning into a gorgeous afternoon. Well, not that it's... Yeah, it started off a bit miserable, actually. There's a bit too much cloud around. Uh, in case you're wondering why we're not watching the Lion Pride at Angala, it's not because they've decided that it's more fun to watch the back of my head as I drive. It's just because there's a bit of a signal problem there. So I think Marcel and Rowan trying to reposition so that they can get a decent signal out. And you can see the lions. Currently not seeing anything very lipidish. Yes, Rachel, you're absolutely right. Binoculars are my best friend, and whenever, any, whenever anybody says to me, what should I bring on safari? What's the first thing I should pack? A lot of people are very surprised to hear me say, upset for binoculars. More than anything else, more than your underpants, your toothpaste, bring some binoculars because it really it will revolutionize your experience. The number of people I took on safari who, you know, you see a little bird or a pretty bird or whatever it was, they just don't see it because they don't have a set of binoculars. You'd hand yours back, they'd throw them on the floor by mistake. And so I just stopped lending my binoculars to people after a while best to bring your own. Most of these really high-end lodges will actually provide binoculars for their guests, but yes, definitely bring binoculars if you come on safari. Alternatively, a massively long lens on your camera Peter, you want to know if cats ever use traps to find prey? In other words, do they build traps to catch their prey? Oh, tracks. No, I don't think they use tracks to find their prey. I don't think that they look for tracks. I think that they use their noses to track. They definitely do track, but I think they use their noses. They're able to smell, like a tracking dog can smell where their prey has gone. And so that's what I think they use. I don't think that they use the actual footprints. Well, Shadulu didn't come down here, which is quite a good sign, really. We'll drive along the southern boundary. I know Trish did do this earlier, but I'm not sure she covered as much of it as we will. Right, let's go over to Trish. Now, we still don't have Angala, and I'll look for some lipper tracks on the road here. I'm also hoping that I have some tracks here at Chitwa, but nothing so far. James did say he saw some this morning, a little bit um, further east of this point I'm at at the moment. So we'll go check those out. And then I will also be looking at the trees as I move along and not just on the ground as I learnt my lesson. I'm almost feeling the temptation to, I mean, after we go around Chitwa. It's hard to, to have timings here. Because you say, oh, I'm just going to do this, or just going to do that, and then come around and do this, and then you're stopping for animals along the way, and before you know it, it's the end of show, and you don't manage to do anything. 
that you actually planned, but you still managed to get the animals. Um, and I'm still feeling like I want some elephants because I had a really nice time with them earlier when I was, or you were with me. Oh, I think I see some piggies. They, so, they run so quickly. Oh, and they've run. Kiara, you're 16 years old. You'd like to have animals ever get concussed. Concussed. Well, there's no reason why they shouldn't. No. Just watching this male come through here. Um, if they sustain an, a, uh, um, an injury, a head injury, there's no reason why they wouldn't get concussed. Oh, does this animal have an eye injury? Just a little bit of crust, perhaps. Can you see some whiteness? Let's have a good look as it comes through. Hey, hey. Look here, no pun intended. There is a bit of a sheen, a white sheen. Now that happens when... Or when an eye is injured and the space or the chamber that is between the actual eyeball and the cornea loses a lot of circulation well not really circulation but in terms of blood but circulation in terms of important chemicals um, and it can cause that cloudiness so it's very possible that that animal is blind in that eye Animals that are, and also people that are blind in an eye, also tend to lose some kind of portion of control or bodily function when it comes to that, and they can have a leaky eye. So I think that's what that animal has got. But it seems that Rowan is back. Yay! So let's go over to him and his lion, see what they're getting up to. Prod. Yeah, sorry, we had a again signal issues every now and then. But anyway, there's been a lot of grooming, yawning, tail wagging, a bit of growling, um, some walking around. But it seems that the pride is nearly getting ready to move. One of the youngsters has moved off a little bit to the east, and actually, everyone's watching him now. Should I say her? more of them are starting to get up. <laughs> it is a very slow process waking up for lions. Unless, you know, if a herd of elephants had to move in here, it would be a whole different story. Otherwise, they all have to allo groom, lick each other, re-establish those social bonds and then they only start moving a little bit later though i must say it's cooling down quite nicely so i don't think they are going to wait too long until they get on the move again see the young male he's got his head up he's looking good he's still not putting any pressure on his leg mia from the uk He's only eight years old, wants to know how big male lions get. Mia, um, to about 250 kilograms. Usually it's very, very heavy. I think it's about 500 pounds. It's a very big muscular animal. I must say, I think of this young male, he'll stand up soon and you'll see his size compared to the females. Um, if he had to grow up and become a very big male lion, he's going to be huge. I've had him walk past the vehicle and the arch of his back is actually above my bull bar. Quite nice seeing them walking away. They're doing exactly what they did the other day is all of them are going to one specific tree and oh, here he's up. 
Now you can see he's still not putting any pressure on that leg yet. So I think the swelling, of course, he's been lying down all day. So I think the wound is quite cold still, but he is moving, which is good. <laughs> Big sneeze. This is how we found them the other day as we were walking on their tracks, trying to track them down. And we actually heard one sneezing. Of course, Sean and I ran back to the vehicle, drove in, and then there they were. Seems they are moving east again. It's been quite funny. They've been spending a lot of time uh, in the eastern part of the reserve, which is really not in the center of their territory. It used to be the center of Ngala or Anbiya Ngala, we thought. But now in the east, I think it's because there are so many wildebeest and zebras that they are spending a lot of time in that area. See how big he is compared to the youngster next to him. Bless you. He's thin. Yeah, he's quite thin on the headphones. Time for a meal. Why has not been with him for quite a, well, a long time now? Before that, they were off the eastern boundary, so we don't actually know if they, he was with them there. But I'm pretty sure if they hunt anything tonight, that he'll definitely eat from that as well. Of course, the females aren't going to be too happy to share with him, but they will in the end. So where they're walking now, we might lose signal again for a little while, but we'll try catch up with them on the other side. It's quite thick vegetation there. But I'm sure because they're walking quite steadily in an easterly direction, we should be able to keep up. Okay, so it seems the picture is a little bit fuzzy. We're going to send you over to James and Juma and then see if we can relocate on the other side. I'm afraid, yeah, they're definitely in a bit of a dodgy area there. We're, we've come back to the dam here. We've done a kind of full circle around. I was hoping to do a little walk around and see if I could find where the leopard went. Well, there are her tracks there. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see these, but maybe she came down to this tree and marked upon it. And you see here, BK, was that too close? So there's a footprint, but where did you go from there? Possibly across the dam wall, but maybe, quite possibly, she marked here did a bit of a scrape and then carried on because she came down that road there. But I don't see her feet here, nor do I see them here. So maybe she marked and turned around and went back out that way or went to lie in the bush just the other side of the waterhole, which is a popular spot for leopards to lie. We'll drive down here and then circle back around towards the waterhole because now is the kind of time you'd expect the cats to start get moving. The cats to start get moving. It doesn't sound right, does it? Now is the time you'd expect the cats to start moving. There we are. So I think she probably marked on that tree. Vial on a territory. No, she did. She came along here. Here we go. Phew. We do a lot of leopard tracking, don't we? We do a lot of. Oh, there's a leopard track. And a. Uh, well, doesn't always result in a leopard, does it? Franklin's on the road, we'll have a look at. They've gone off the road, we won't look at them. 
Yes, Andy, there are lots and lots. The one we're following now, the leopard doesn't move in the herd. The diker, the stienbok, the scrub hare, although they have little groups. The slender mongoose, the mellers mongoose, the white-tailed mongoose, the civet, the honey badger, the genet, the... What else is solitary? The cheetah, quite often, female cheetah. So lots and lots of animals are solitary. By no means is everything in a pack or a group. Various strategies for optimal survival out here. She came along this way. We might bump into her. That would be great. It would be wonderful. I would be happy in my heart. Natalie's saying she has high hopes for me this week because we've bumped into lots of leopards. Well, that is true. We have been very lucky. I do not see her further footprints every ha, but we shall carry on here. What we really need is for her to have found something to snack upon on her walk and then to have stashed it in a tree close by. We're going to go to Trish now. She is, uh, I don't know what she's doing actually, I imagine she's probably heading slowly back towards Juma. Even though he didn't know what I was doing, he was absolutely correct. I am slowly heading back to Juma. And um, I actually thought the treehouse dam would be a great place to check. And I'm glad that he's checked it out as well. I told you there were tracks that came in Hukumuri there. Well, I'm thinking it's Okamori because it was exactly where he'd come in by Zoe's and then we had those tracks by uh, on Rebecca's heading south so I thought Trias Dam is a good place to check and I'm sure that James has some good luck today hopefully he'll bump a leopard now I'm going to pay a visit to Bifflesuk Dam since I'm in the east I haven't been there in a long time Who knows what I'll bump there. Sunset is beautiful. I was just saying to Darby, imagine the amount of sunrise and sunsets we've seen. Darby, Anushka would like to know what you like most about the bush, Darby. I can tell you he likes sunrises and sunsets, but sunrises more because we just had this discussion. Oh, oh, nice one, Darby. He says he enjoys the mystery that it holds. I second that. Those are some beautiful clouds out there, Darby. Let's have a look. Speaking of the mystery that it holds, we just saw a tree that looked like it had a mouth and eyes and it was shocked at something. And we thought about all the reasons it could be that way. Maybe it's somebody trapped in a tree. All these things. So the bush really um, exercises your imagination. We see beautiful clouds. All these amorphous things that you can just kind of make your own out of, which I love. Nothing is too defined or too distinct. Even a leopard in a tree is, mm, is it a leopard? Is it a branch? What is it? I really, really love that. Some cool clouds there. Last bit of sun rays. The sun's already set behind the mountains. You still get that nice pink hue. Anything else, Darwin? What about your friends? <laughs> if you think about that. <laughs> and he doesn't respond, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to look at me for a second. 
well, this uh, car. I don't know which day they want to turn, but they're moving so quickly. Not this way. Okay. There you go. Hmm. I got a wave from the cage of men in the back. Lucky us, Dali. Okay, Buffalsuk. Here we come. I hope you're all preparing for Mother's Day tomorrow. I haven't spent a Mother's Day with my mother in years, I think. Not by choice, though. We live in different countries. But tomorrow we shall all say Happy Mother's Day to our mummies. All right, I'll send you over to Rowan and his lions in the meantime at Ambiance and Gala, and I'm going to head to the dam. So I thought they were walking east, and then it turned out they were going more south. So of course, luckily we did manage to find them again, and then they popped out on the road. You'll just see more and more of them coming out. So the little white lioness leading, and then her brother right next to her. How beautiful is that? Just more lions coming and coming and coming. And to the right, the, I think the two females in front now are the oldest. No, sorry. The one on the right is the white dot female, the lead lioness. And then her sister is now next to her, on her right. And then there comes the young male, also limping along, but keeping up quite well. Still not putting any pressure on the leg, but he's able to run. I mean, you can see he's able to run on three legs. Ah, there they go. They're going to come right past the vehicle. Um, it, like, I'm just absolutely amazed by how big the white line's head is. Every single time I see him, it's a huge bale. But of course, coming from the genes of these lionesses, it is just absolutely fantastic. Hello, boy. So this is that moment where every guest on your car stops breathing. Natalie is saying we're recreating the moment Sean had with the lions. So she's having a bit of deja vu. And of course, the youngest, the little white lioness, her sister, is coming. And, oh, sorry, I blocked your path there a little bit. Bouncing all the way past us. I'm just going to turn around once this one passes. See how it's always amazing they look at the tracker seat first because it sits on the bonnet, but it's higher the rest of the vehicle. That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Very thankful that they came back onto the road. Just quickly turning around. We might actually see where they go, but they are up. They're going straight into the river. So we've still got a lioness here. So what we're going to try to do is just zoom around and you'll have them crossing the river. Once this lioness gets off the road, I'm not going to push her off the road. I'll wait there for you. Alrighty. Thank you, lioness. Let's go quickly find them in the river. At least the crossing is right over here. It's about a 200 meters. Then I'm sure we'll have them drop down into the Timbavati. So I'm in low range already, which is why the revs are so high. Actually, I'm going to have all this and of course here we are, some helmets in your file. Sorry guys to break up your party, but good afternoon anyway. Here we go. Don't 
and turn around. Sorry guys, I'm sure you'll be back up and running in no time. I am motoring along to the dam. That experience of having lions walk by you so close to you, something very, very special. I remember the first time that it ever happened to me it was during our SABC TV show, which was, yo, how long ago now? A year? No, less than a year. I think it was end of last year ish. Or just before. No, just after. Or was it the year before? Whatever it was. Anyway, it was during our first SABC TV show. And I had both the Evoca males. And I was oh, not particularly familiar with their movements yet. You know, once you spend a lot of time with animals, you can really... Have very nuanced behavior or expression. Um, so you feel comfortable and know exactly when you can't feel when you can't feel comfortable. And when those two boys walked actually alongside me here, I was, I think, actually nervous. Actually nervous, and they were absolutely they were perfect. And since then, I'd, I think, I'd be fine given my experience for them to walk by me. It's very special. Very special. They um, they look at you, which is interesting. I think it's interesting because for me that says that they can tell that there are eyes in the vehicle. Um, a lot of the time and the explanation that we get and we give about why animals don't don't attack us on the vehicles is because they don't realize that we're a separate thing on the vehicles. And um, when the when they, the way that they walk past you and they look at you tells me that sometimes they look at you and your cameraman, so they see two pairs of eyes. But whether they can make the distinction between bodies, that's what I think that they can't do. So it just looks like one big thing with maybe four eyes. I don't know. Natalie, I got a question about how do you become a game ranger if I didn't get your name? Hi, Craig. You're 10 years old. We'd like to know how do you become a game ranger? Well, you've got to take a course called a Fagasa course, Field Guide Association of South Africa. And you do different levels. And after you've completed level one, you can um, start working in a lodge. It's not, um, it's very doable. But now, since you're 10 years old, I'm not sure you can do the Fogasa exams just yet. But you can read and read and read and get interested and get out into your garden or your backyard and just watch stuff. Stuff. That's how I first got into this, this field in general, particularly a ranger or a guide, but the field of natural sciences. Just went outside and just to watch and play. That's how I learned and I used to have lots of books I remember my dad bought for me these three books that were cardboard books. You know those ones that you get for really young kids? And um, I must have been about six. And each page had a different animal cut out on the top. So when you turn the page, you can use the animal's tail or whatever to use to go to the next page. And I distinctly remember the koala. There was an Australia one with koalas and things in it. And then there was, let's just go past the quarry pan, chameleon, the chameleon round tail in the one. That's definitely stuck. I just love them so much. This is what is left 
Quarry Pan. Oh, look, there's a three banded plover in Quarry Pan. It's a late night bird today. <laughs> Your feet are getting muddy. Footprints. Looking for little invertebrates buried in that mud. It's nice and calm and this evening. No interruptions by the rest of the birds that would be there at Chitwa. It's decided not. I'm more into social distancing. Let me get to Gwari Pan, see what's happening there. so far. So I'm going to keep on moving. Let this plover enjoy the evening and I'll send you back over to James to get a bit of an update. We are having a boat cruise. <coughs> Excuse me. An evening boat cruise. The tracks of that cat came down in here, but I lost them, I'm afraid, and it's now too dark to see anything without a spotlight. Oh, a big hole. The elephants have dug much hole in this riverbed. They have done this on account of the fact that they were looking for fresh water and it was easy to find here. So if you do get seasick, I apologize. I think we'll just drive up here and then kind of circle back towards the clearings outside camp, which has had quite a lot of activity around them in the last few days. Maybe we'll get an owl in here. An owl. We've had rose eagles owls, we've had spotted eagle owls, we've had barn owls, we've had white-faced owls in here, barred owls in here. We've almost certainly had a pearl spotted owl as well. They like the big trees. And then just in here, was it in there? Yeah, it was in there. Tundi kept her cubs very briefly. The last litter, the litter she lost, she kept in there for about a night. It's right in there. Nothing in there now. And then she lost them. That was the. Well, I think that was the last time we saw them, actually. Rachel, my favourite bird in South Africa is the Cape Robin Chat. My favorite bird here, because it's like the Cape Robin Chat, is the white browed Scrub Robin. I just love their calls. They make me feel cheerful. And the Cape Robin Chat, interestingly, is South Africa's favorite bird. It beat the fish eagle into first place. The South Africa's favorite bird, and I suspect that it managed to do that because most people feel about it like I do, those who know what it is. And that is, it's this connection with wilderness in the cities of this country. It lives in a lot of cities in, in gardens, and it lives in the wild as well, not in this particular area, but it does live in the wild. And it's just got a most, the most beautiful song that is, I found so cheerful and cheering when I lived in Johannesburg to wake up, especially on a cold, miserable Johannesburg winter's morning, to have the little 
robin chat calling on the garden tap was just a real nice warm reminder that the wilderness was never too far away if you looked hard enough for it. Enjoyed that too. So, the cave robin chat. I was very surprised when I heard that it was South Africa's favourite bird because I thought surely it would be the fish eagle or the marshall eagle or, I don't know, some, some other great and famous bird, the batelier. Our national bird is the blue crane. Maybe that would be it. Signal is not going so well here. Let's get back to the I hope that his river cruise gets better with a bit more a bit more signal. But I just had a thought in my little head and it said, this looks like a good road for comedians. I have no control over this. So I'm just going to keep an eye out. I promise not both. One I will be looking out for leopard. The other one will be looking out for a chameleon. Because then I'd have eyes like a chameleon if I could do that. I hope you all found that very funny. I did. <laughs> Natalie found it funny. so quiet. I must even say that the Impala Rams have been pretty quiet this afternoon. Even. Oh, Anushka. Davi would also like to add that he really likes the smell here. It's very clean and crisp and fresh. And he loves big open expanses, which this place has until you see the lights of Shlivokani in the background. <laughs> Hope you're all looking with me. Now, usually I would say, ah, oh, it's getting too cold for comedians now. They won't be out and about. And generally speaking, that is what we would believe. Because in books and things like that, it says that, especially in the winter, I mean, it's not people winter yet, but in the winter, they will find a little crevice. And Mishka says, thank you. Um, they'll find a little, little crevice to get into. But, remember when we had Nonoka, our beloved comedian friend, whose tree got eaten by an elephant one sad day? Um, she, we had her through the winter. We'd see her almost every day. So, I definitely don't give up on looking for chameleons just because it is a little cooler. Calcix, you'd like to know how is a young Pegasus? Calcix, I'm sure you asked before as well. Maybe. So, you're a consulting detective. One of you asked, but Calcix, young Pegasus is. I'm a bad mother. Young Pegasus, I have no idea how he's doing. He has been uh, um, in my cupboard. He's taking a gap year in my cupboard at the moment. A gap few weeks. Um, 
I will be going on leave on from the 15th. So I'll have to bring young Pegasus out before that. I'll say, young Pegasus, Uncle Kelsix inquired about you. Do we like? Snakes. Snakes. Do, does Darby and I like snakes? I do. Or do Darby and I like snakes? Rachel asks. You like snakes, Darby? I do. I like them too. I think that they're really pretty, really strange, extraordinary organisms. No legs. That gets me every time. No legs. The way they move, the fact that, the fact that they can move with such grace, shall I say. Someone's trying to talk, but it's not. Um, yeah, I do like snakes. I do. I think they're very pretty and... Just something about the way they move is fascinating. Also, the fact that they produce venom. That is, to me, crazy. Venom is such an expensive um, fluid. Animals that produce it are just on top for me. What did I see? Okay, I can't see what it is, Davi, but I only have. Um, you're gonna have to look with the IR. Can you? It's, I think it's a bush baby. Just exactly where I'm pointing in there. Hi, you is. Try and see if you can see it with your eye. It's on that, that exact tree there. Somewhere around. I don't know if you'll be able to. Alright. Try with the infrared. Oh. Okay, James has a leopard, so let's go to him quickly and I'll try and find if this was a bush baby. This is Mawati. Well, I mean, okay, if you say so. <laughs> Maybe Louise saw his face in the preview screen. I think it's him, though. Very special. Hey, two Mawati sightings in one week. This guy is really expanding his range. And I think we can be relatively confident that this cat is the father of Tundi's babies. I'm going to let him move before we carry on. I know this is not the best view. We're in infrared. But just look at the way he's looking at us. Look at his body language. We're quite far away from him. Oh, he's eating something big. Is that Mawati? Is that not Tingana? Doesn't look like Tingana either. Remember, I am terrible at this, so... I am not to be taken too seriously. He's gone off in here. The last time I saw Mulwati, 
Okay, James Richard confirming. Definitely Mulwati. So I suspect that's probably the last we'll see of him. What I'm not going to do is, pu is um, push the issue at all because he's had a nice experience with us now. Just, we stopped as soon as we saw him. He drank, he was quite calm. And so I think that there he is. Oh, there's something in there. So I'm not gonna hit any stumps and go after him. I just saw some eyes down there. We'll have one quick look, and as long as there are no bushes that we're going to have to mow over, because that will be unreasonable on us, of us all. Yeah, I think let's just call this quits here. Noisy for a leopard. Shut up, bird. All right, so what we're going to do with this particular sighting is appreciate that we've had a really nice sighting with the cat. He calmed down. As soon as we stopped, we turned out the light and he had his drink. He was very relaxed like that and then he walked off. So we're not going to try and follow him through here. We're not going to try and um, bash after him. I don't think whatever was making the noise in front of us was him either. So I'm just going to do a little loop through this long grass clearing. In the meantime, let's go to Trish and see what she's doing. I have a friend for you, everyone. This is not the bush baby we saw earlier. <laughs> I haven't seen one in ages. So we came, we saw that bush baby that we had to send you to James for to see more Wati, which was awesome, by the way. And then we just managed to find that bush baby. And then we, we lost it because it jumped out. They're incredible jumpers. Look at those massive eyes. Oh, and there it goes, onto the ground. That was so fortunate, because we left that bush baby because it jumped away and then we found you and you were just in time. <laughs> now I hear an elephant. Let's just see where you are. Beautiful elephant, because I hear you. Elephants in the darkness can be a little bit um, dicey, especially if you don't notice them. And then you maybe very quickly drive past or something like that. It's not ideal. But there's a bit of a drainage there. I think he was probably in there. Oh. Got you. Now where's the rest of your family? It's in there. Straight in there. You can only see the, the shaking of the leaves as the elephant eats. It's hiding.
I think the others are just a little behind me in the drainage. Because I don't see any others around, definitely. Just this one, it's quite not very big, but it doesn't sound like the same one I heard before. Oh, it smells nice here. We're at the dam. It almost smells like um, boiled beetroot. Very earthy smell. a bit of you. Oh, this is very cool. Uh, shall we look at the hippo in front of us? It's out the water first, Darby. Sorry. It's just we don't get to see that too often. It's a bit dark. Sorry. Alright, we'll have to... It's a bit dark, so we'll go further along. There's two now. Um. Alright, quick look at the elephants and then we'll move forward and we'll have a look at the hippo. I'm just going to be a little bit careful as I do that. I don't want to be distracted by looking at the elephants as well. And they've decided they want to move off in that time. Oh well, I'll let you hear them. There, you can hear them. Now let's go see these hippos and approach them carefully. I was about to say I haven't been to the dam at night, and it's um, at Buffalo Dam at night, at least not very often. And there's a, a quite an, a nice feeling about it. Let me just put these off. They look pretty calm. A little bit closer, how's that, Darby? Two hippos out of the water. Going along for their for their nighttime feed. Hi Lila. You're from Florida and you're 12 years old. You'd like to know if we get crocodiles and alligators? We do get crocodiles. We get the Nile crocodile here. That's a very, very large crocodile. Very big, with a very strong bite. You really didn't, wouldn't want to get bitten by that creature. I guess the same goes for alligators too, right? So you would get a lot of alligators in Florida. Let's just... Let me just pay attention while I leave this guy's art. Right, we might get one more view here. I'm just going to get a little bit past it. So if we need to, we can move quickly. Well, those are one of the butts of the bush you don't get to see as often. There was a youngster out a little bit to the left, but I think it's moved further in. Cool. That was a nice little exploration of the dam. We took this road and we got to see bush babies, elephants and hippos. Alright, I'm going to keep on going. Obviously heading in the direction of home now and I'll send you over to James for a bit of an update. We too are rushing for home now. Rushing. But not rushing. We're just going home. We have a few minutes left on what has been a thoroughly satisfying afternoon. It feels quite quiet, but I suppose that's because we sat for a long time. But we had lions at Ingala, we had elephants here times two, times three actually, I think. 
Trish found three separate herds. And then we had the hyena cubs and we had a bonus leopard at the end. Marvellous, marvellous. And now I shall make my way home to the smell of the potato bush. The potato bush, Phylanthus reticulatus, is a bush that smells like a potato. It's quite difficult to find, but it only smells when the night is cool, and so you normally smell it in winter. And for me, it's massively reminiscent of my first year at Angala, and all my time actually in the low felt. I remember it so distinctly from those first few months of taking game drives. There was also a huge one that lived outside the room where I lived at Londolozi, and so the smell is full of happy memories. Let's see if there's anything going on over here at the waterhole. Now my spotlight's stuck. It's amazing, you cannot see anything with the spotlight over the water. Let's stop and have a listen. <sighs> Should we go into colour, BK, or do you think it's too horrible? It's horrible? Is it horrible? Okay, we'll stay like this. Let me be quiet for a while. say good night to you now everybody so that you can have the last few minutes of listening to this and if you do enjoy the sounds you can always go to the damn cam where you'll hear the night so thank you for your questions and comments it's been a lovely entertaining quiet rejuvenating saturday afternoon we'll see you tomorrow at 0600